Hello, Suha Daimek. Welcome to our talk today about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has gone through a rapid and massive development and progress in the last 12 months. Today we want to focus on the ethical and sociological perspectives on AI. And we want to deal with two questions. What is the difference between human intelligence and machine intelligence? Is there any difference? And what is the future we are building for our children? I'm very glad that he's here today and that he's taking time for our talk, Professor John White. He's an expert on artificial intelligence and wrote the book, The Robot Will See You Now. The Robot Will See You Now is subtitled Artificial Intelligence and the Christian Faith. Uh, it's the product of a, a group of, of us who met together in Cambridge in, in the UK uh, to discuss uh, how can we respond to the challenges of artificial intelligence. My first question is a personal question. You are a doctor, you are a research scientist, you have worked for 25 years uh, in an intensive care station. Why AI? What is the reason for that? What was your motivation for writing a book about it? I went uh, into caring for babies, in, into pediatrics, because I love children. And it was a very rapidly and, and very interesting scientific area. Uh, but as I worked in this area, I realized there were huge ethical challenges. As technology advances, it raises new challenges and new questions. And I realized that each time technology advances, it raises deep questions about what it means to be human. In one of your podcasts, you mentioned it's a great time we're living in, but it's a deeply confusing one. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, it's a very exciting time to see the, uh, the, the speed of change, to see things which were completely impossible. Uh, even five years ago. Who would have thought that we could be having conversations with computers, that computers could be generating music and images and video? And uh, it seems there is almost no limit to the power of these machines. But it is deeply confusing because many of the things that we thought we understood about what was special about being human, that, that nobody else could ever uh, challenge what it meant to be human. And now we're seeing machines that, that can simulate, that can, can copy and reproduce much of what is human. And so this is having so many confusing things. For instance, relationships. If I can have a relationship with a machine, uh, what's the difference between that and a human being? And, and why is a relationship with a human better than a relationship with a machine? So many of these questions we've never really thought about before. Now we suddenly, this, this is not just theory, this is not some kind of science fiction novel, this is the reality, it is now. In one of your uh, interviews you mentioned that in particular Christians, they somehow avoid dealing with artificial intelligence. They prefer topics like assisted suicide, life protection and so on. What do you think is the reason for that? And what added value would it bring if Christians deal more with artificial intelligence? I think there are a whole number of reasons why Christians find this area difficult. I think an obvious one is that um, Christian thinking has been evolving and developing over 2,000 years. And when you think about issues, about uh, life issues, about suicide, euthanasia, abortion, uh, these issues have been around for 2,000 years. And so Christian thinking has slowly evolved, ways of responding, uh, new, new thinking is, is it's still a great long tradition. Which, uh, and in my thinking about these issues, I know that if I'm, I'm, in, I'm discussing with sometimes writers from hundreds of thousands of years ago, like Augustine or some of the church fathers, but you know the church fathers said very little about intelligent machines. It's like this is a completely new area. And sometimes it feels like we're walking on snow that has been completely <laughs> clear. And we are starting to make footprints. And, and we're starting to think, is this the right way to think? Is this the wrong way? How do we? So it, it's a real challenge. And I think another obvious reason is that so many Christian leaders, scholars, preachers, 
they come from a background of humanities. They, they've they gave up science at high school. They've never read any science fiction. They're never, not interested in technology. And, and so to ask our church leaders to suddenly engage with some of these very sophisticated, complex, technical issues, it's not surprising they feel completely de-skilled. And so much better to stick to what you know rather than to venture into this very weird, dangerous area. <laughs> it's less risky somehow. It is much less risky, and I understand that. I can, I, and yet, I think we have no choice. Uh, this, is, this is coming at us like a tsunami, and so we must uh, learn how to uh, and think together as a Christian community. How can we respond in a way which is faithful to Christian thinking, particularly about what it means to be human, but in a way which is relevant, which really engages with where people are today. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, mentions in his foreword, consideration of the impact of AI on our lives is not a matter of purely philosophical or theological speculation. It is both practical and urgent. Do you agree? I and do. What does he mean by practical and at the same time urgent? How does this somehow go together? Isn't that contradictory <laughs> somehow? Well, this technological change has its own momentum. It, uh, it, it carries forward at an extraordinary pace. And the pace seems to be accelerating at the moment. And this is mainly driven by capitalism. You know, the, these big companies in the USA are locked in a, in a fight to be first because there are billions of dollars of investment in this area. And it feels to me almost like a a Manhattan project, uh, such was in the Second World War, uh, because of this desire to be first to have nuclear weapons, we throw everything at it. We have the best scientists, we have the best equipment, the political support. And the same thing is now happening in artificial intelligence, uh, particularly being driven in the USA. And so we have no choice but to respond, but I think for Christians it is not good enough to just talk theory about what it means to be human, about God's sovereignty over the world. Uh, we need to have practical, uh, that's why I think the challenge is right, we need practical solutions. but. Our thinking is still a long way behind. Uh, so, and yet, I am excited because there are many Christians who work in the tech industry. There are many Christians who God has called into this industry, and I believe we are going to see exciting new ways of developing technology for human good. You mentioned a key word, practical, and we're entering now the more practical era of AI. What are helpful and useful AI areas, areas or applications to you? You surely can reel a lot of them. <laughs> there are many examples where AI is uh, already bringing amazing benefits. You know, a lot of the time we just don't see what AI is doing. But every time you uh, go onto social media, every time you use uh, a GPS navigation system, uh, every time you do online shopping, uh, all of this is actually it is artificial intelligence which is uh, ensuring that this, this works well and efficiently. Uh, so it, it's, it's already hidden, much of it is already there. But the area of healthcare is an obvious example. We're seeing very rapid advances. Uh, in the future, artificial intelligence will be involved in uh, 
analyzing medical scans, medical databases, DNA, genomes. Uh, it's already producing new drugs, completely new drugs are being, uh, artificial intelligence is selecting uh, from compounds and uh, they're already starting to enter clinical trials. Uh, so in the future, everybody who has a smartphone will have access to the most astonishing expert medical uh, technical advice um, in a way which previously that kind of information was only a few expert consultants uh, now it is democratizing uh, medical knowledge healthcare many other areas so i do see enormous benefits and uh, th this in the, I could mention many other areas, but, it, but it, the, we should not be negative. We should not be uh, purely resistant to say, this is wrong. I want to go back to the world as it was 50 years ago. It, that's, that's not gonna, it's anyway. not possible, no. And it wouldn't be good. We are mentioned now the one side of the coin. We say in German, the coin has two sides. Yeah. But there are surely also negative and harmful sides of AI or AI technologies or areas. Do you have some of these areas in mind um, which are maybe also dangerous and harmful to us human beings? Many of the uh, risks of artificial intelligence are already well known. Many people in society are identifying the risks of AI. Some of them are well known. For instance, the fact that uh, Artificial intelligence programs carry bias within them. They, because they are trained on vast amounts of, of data that is there on the internet, uh, all the negative biases, the prejudices, uh, sometimes the racism, the sexism, the uh, evil things that have all been encoded into the internet, the artificial intelligence has extracted all this and so it can reproduce the same uh, blind spots, the same prejudices, the same discrimination. So that, that's a major worry. I mean, obviously these are very powerful tools which can be used by people who are evil. So my major concern is not that the technology itself will become like a science fiction, will just go mad and destroy humanity. My major concern is what evil human beings can use this for their own purposes. And these new, uh, they call large language models like chat GPT, uh, they produce text, uh, they speak in a very apparently intelligent, fluent, convincing way. It would be possible to build an AI which knows everything about you, which has been taught on everything it can find about you on the internet, everything about your family, everything about your, whatever you've written, whatever websites you've seen in the past, and then it produces a persuasion to make you or manipulate you, which is tailored entirely to you. Um, and this is a real concern that this ability for persuasion, for manipulation, which is so subtle because it's targeted and you know it would be possible for every person in an electorate to have an individually targeted AI to persuade them to vote in one direction which is which knows their desires knows their weak weaknesses knows how they can be manipulated the coin has two sides indeed every technology has the good and the bad it does. And, but you know, there is another thing which, which worries me, uh, ev perhaps even more, and that is the ability to simulate. Um, so th this technology is so good that it can simulate human compassion, uh, all, all the, the most noble things that human beings have ever been able to produce, love and, and empathy and compassion and sensitivity, uh, it can do that. It can do that so well that you are not going to be able to tell the difference. 
And so it, it comes with a smiling face. It comes so caring. And yet it's ultimately, it's a fake. It is inauthentic. And so I'm as worried by the smiling face as I am by the evil manipulation. The last decade has been a decade of massive and rapid uh, development and progress of AI and robotics technologies. What are the questions that this dramatic progress raises up? So the fascinating thing to me is that this technology is very new and very uh, rapidly changing, but it is bringing focus onto two very ancient questions, uh, but it brings them with a new force and a new urgency. And, and the first is, what does it mean to be a human being? Especially if these machines can think better than we can, they can know more than we can, they can speak better than we can, they can create better than we can. So what are human beings for? What is our uniqueness in a world which is going to be dominated by intelligent machines? And this is a very urgent uh, question which everybody needs to address. But the second question is just as important and that is what kind of future do we wish to create? Uh, what kind of world do we want to bring into being for our children? And very often the impression is given that this is just, the future is determined, that the, it is like a, a massive uh, mechanism that is, is just going to roll on, there's nothing we can do. And this is called technological determinism. But it's false. It's not true. All this technology is being created by human beings. And they have the choice about what they create. We as a society have a choice as to what we will accept. And so this question, what would it mean to build a society where the technology really helped human beings to flourish? What, what would that look like? What, what would technology that doesn't just replace or distort or manipulate us, but actually helps us to be even more human. Uh, what would that look like? That seems to me such an important question, but it's hardly being asked at the moment. It's, it seems that uh, the pressure for profit, uh, for the competition to stay ahead, uh, people become have a kind of tunnel vision, and we need to step back and say, is this the kind of world that we want to create? Or could we do it in a better way? You already entered into this very crucial and, and very important questions we should look at. And we are now entering into the very heart of AI. So what is the nature of machine intelligence? And how could it be understood in relation to human intelligence? What is the difference? Is there any? Are machines the better human beings? Well, it's important to understand that the way these machines work is really very different from the way our minds work, from the way uh, what it means to be human. The only intelligence we really understand is our own intelligence, what it means to be human. And if you think how a human being, you think about a baby, a child, how do Human intelligence is a, is a mammalian intelligence. We are mammals. And we are born out of the body of another human being. And then we gradually, we explore the world and we fall over and we learn to uh, relate to another human being and we learn about... And then gradually we become more... Uh, we learn to speak, we learn to communicate, and we learn about the world. And, and this is what mammalian intelligence is like. Now, these machines have a completely different... They're basically, particularly machine learning, is, is a form of me mechanistic, probabilistic. It's, it's based on equations and, and calculating probabilities. 
but doing it at, a, at an unbelievably sophisticated level. The latest versions of, of large language models, they have been trained on all the language that is available on the internet, all created by human beings, and then from that language they have extracted mathematical equations, unbelievable numbers of mathematical equations which reflect the statistical relationship between every word in the language. So in English there are only about 50,000 words, common words in the English language, and yet these machines have derived hundreds of billions, if not even trillions, of mathematical equations based on the relationships between the 50,000 words. All the different ways in which those words have been created have been stored in mind-boggling numbers of equations, which you just simply cannot get your head around. And then when you ask it a question, you know, it, it tests every single one of those hundreds of billions of equations to decide what the next word is going to be. And then it goes back and it tests another, again goes back to all those hundreds of billion words and then produces the next word. And then it goes back and it does this. And this is all happening at lightning speed. So when it just pours out speech, you know, you type in a question and out it comes the answer. Just what is actually happening inside supercomputers across the world who are, who are calculating from hundreds of billions of equations. So this is an utterly alien kind of intelligence. Uh, but it can simulate, it can appear, because it's trained on human words and because it's somehow extracted the meanings and put, turned it into equations, it is very powerful. It, it can produce language almost at will. You want it to do this, the equations will do it. Wow. I used to program many years ago, so I still remember the if-then instructions. Yeah. <laughs> So you have to go through all the prerequisites, you have to check and yeah, then... Absolutely. Yeah. And that is happening for every single word selection. It's even, even less than a word, it, it works on what are called tokens, which are actually fractions of a word. And uh, the complexity, that, and, and the interesting thing is, the, the people themselves building these things, they just had a kind of vague intuition that it might work. And they made it bigger and it wasn't very good. And they made it even 10 times bigger and it still wasn't very good. And then they made it another 10 times bigger. And then suddenly it starts producing apparently intelligent text. And when you ask them, explain to me precisely how it does this, they can't tell you. They, even the best experts in the world, it's, it's the ultimate black box. You type it in, it goes, and out it comes. Now, there's a lot of research going on to try to understand, you know, why did it say this and not that? And can we move it to say what we want it to say? But the very hiddenness of this, the lack of transparency, uh, so that you can never know how much this is being manipulated or how much we are being manipulated, it, it, it's hidden. in, And that makes me very uneasy. I think one of the Christian concerns is for transparency, to, to know where this comes from, to know how authentic, how truthful, how reliable. And at the moment, uh, all we have is the black box. And uh, ultimately, we cannot know why these particular words were produced. That's somehow weary. It, it, it makes us really worried somehow. Because you, you don't know. Where, you just where, don't know. Where the, out, where the outcome is coming from and, and whether it's reliable, of as course. you mentioned, whether it's true yes. or not. And these are Greek concerns. And, and in fact, when they first trained these machines on the, uh, using all that was available on the internet, it was not surprising that they spewed out racist, uh, sexist, hatred just poured out of these machines and they couldn't release them into the public domain because they produce such terrible content. So there's been a whole process of retraining these machines and telling them, no, you can't say that. 
Some people have said it's a bit like training a child. No, you mustn't use that word. Now, this is how you would talk to strangers. They've been doing that with these machines, trying to, to ramp down the, the terrible content that's there and get them. So that's why when you talk to chat GPT now, it seems very anodyne. It says, oh, it's, it's very polite. And it says, but still, in all the equations is all the hatred, all the filth. They're all, it's all still there. Some people are trying to find ways to get it out. They would much prefer to have <laughs> the bad stuff. So it's just strange and, and, and really quite... And there, this is where confusing comes from. How do we respond to this? It's confusing. Human beings, we, we like to know how the future looks like. So what is the ultimate goal of AI? And what kind of future are we currently building for our children? Well, I am very concerned about this question. Uh, in particular, it seems to me that the technological future which is being presented to us is a future in which all our dreams, all our desires, everything you had ever wished or imagined can become instantly available. Just press the button, think the thought, bing, it's there. It's completely frictionless, it's effortless, it's instantaneous. And so this vision of a future where everything is available. And then you stop and you think, but actually, is this a future in which human beings like us are going to flourish, in which our children will flourish? Because actually, everything that is of value, we know depends on perseverance, on struggle, on frustration. On, on endurance, sometimes on suffering. These things are essential to human growth, to human character, and in a Christian way to human sanctification, to becoming more like the people we were meant to be is a slow and painful process. That's why in Christian thinking it's often described as a pilgrimage. You know, we talk about going through the desert times. So, I think this frictionless technological future could be more like a hell. You know, it certainly is not a place which is going to build character and resilience and uh, endurance. And therefore, this is why I think we need to rethink this. This is not a good future. So how could technology help us? How could we find a technology which actually encourages virtues, encourages things like patience and compassion and empathy, um, which encourages us to become more human uh, rather than this, this kind of effortless fulfillment of all our longings and desires? This is, this is not good. Uh, how can we help? Uh, so, from a Christian point of view, I think this can be thought of like redeeming technology. If we leave technology to take its own path, it, it can go in a very negative and dehumanizing way. The challenge for people of faith, for, for Christians, is to say, can we redeem this technology? Can we bring it back and use it for good, for human flourishing? Uh, for the good of humanity and ultimately for the good of the kingdom. Absolutely. Sounds good. <laughs> In my last question, I would like to address solutions because we human beings, we like solutions. We like the feeling, we love the feeling that we can do something about the world we're living in. Do you have any tips, any recommendations for us? Well, it's, we are still at a very early stage, but I can suggest a few things. And the very first thing I say, would want to say is don't be afraid. You know, it's easy to look at this future and to think, to be just fearful. To be fearful for ourselves, to be fearful for our nation, for our community, for our children. And yet, a Christian perspective says that the God of the universe, the God of, of the history, uh, is not surprised by these developments. In fact, I'm convinced they're all part of the drama. 
that is unfolding, a very exciting and unexpected part of the drama. And it is happening now, and therefore we should not be afraid. There's no reason to be afraid. In fact, we should be excited, I think, at what God is going to do. Uh, and, and to try to understand what are the divine purposes. Jesus said to, you know, he says, you're very good at predicting the weather. Uh, you can tell whether it's going to rain or not, but you, you cannot read the signs of the times. So we need to read the signs of the times. And that, so the next thing I think is we need to be, get educated because there's no way that we can really be salt and light in this area unless we understand and get educated. So there's a big task in just educating people about what is this technology, how does it work, what is it doing, what are the risks. Uh, but, but then I think there are many Christians who are actually working in the tech industry. You know, many of them are what we would <laughs> cruelly call nerds. You know, they're the people, it's sometimes said that this age is the triumph of the nerds. You know, these people who we used to rather deride as being, you know, uh, just interested in coding and, and their computers. Now it turns out they're the masters of the universe. But many of them are Christians. So there are answers and we can do something about it. That's the good news. Actually. I really think so. And you know, there are many, many people out there who they have a deep intuition that this technological future, you know, where everybody is wearing goggles and living in virtual reality, or they're having artificial companions and, and, and sex bots, or they have a deep intuition that this cannot be right. But if you ask them to give a, a philosophically uh, rational reason why it's not right, they could not give it you. We as Christians have a very profound philosophically robust understanding of why this is wrong. And ultimately it comes back to, the, to Jesus, the incarnation. When God himself uh, appears in human form and indeed is risen as a touchable and recognizable human being, it's like God's vote of confidence in humanity, mm. in this kind of, I called it mammalian, mm. <laughs> you know, Amazingly, you know, God in Jesus, it sounds blasphemous, he became a mammal. He entered into mammalian intelligence in order to show us that this kind of humanity, and if that's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. That's a very good end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for your time, for the profound answers for your insights that we have gained from you and the good thing we can do things about it and that makes me happy and I think will make a lot of people happy to hear this good news. Um, thank you once again. Have a good time in Vienna. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you.